Okay, so um, I'm going to continue uh, what Pastor Justin, um, we began a, f- a couple of weeks ago, I think it was now, with a panel. Um, and um, by the way, this, you know, this old, uh, I'm just a dumb old Alabama boy. Uh, anybody who uh, really will buy that, I have a bridge in Brooklyn I'd like to sell you. <laughs> This guy is one of the sharpest, most intuitively intelligent, and spiritually perceptive guys I know. And so that's why I want him to be my pastor, and that's why I'm so honored to be on uh, the, uh, the platform uh, as one of your pastors. Uh, my name is Joel Hunter, by the way, if we haven't met. Uh, and I love this guy right down here, too. Man, what a great guy. Anyhow, before I get into this, yeah, yeah, you, do that, do that. You've got an incredible group of pastors here. So... Um, but a few weeks ago, or a couple of weeks ago, we had a panel. We, we responded to questions, and, and then last week, Pastor uh, Justin um, said, you know, we gathered up some of those questions, and it, a lot of them had to do with grief and about living on after, you know, hurts. And so he, he addressed the five stages of grief, the famous five stages of grief, um, and, and the denial, the anger, the bargaining, the depression, and the acceptance. What I'd like to do for you is introduce you to the sixth stage of grief. The sixth stage. Now, if you haven't heard about this, it's because I just made it up. (laughs) But if if all you can do is just accept the grief you've been through, you haven't gone as far as God wants you to. You you haven't gone as far as God is going to empower you to do. And so I want to talk to you about the sixth stage of grief, which is a wider view When you come through the hurt you've come through and you're still struggling, God does that so that we can understand the world in a new way, so that we can see better than we've ever seen. You know, my uh, son is an ophthalmologist. He is a LASIK and cataract surgeon. And and, and this verse that I I, I told him I was going to be preaching on, this is Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 and 23. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, now the Greek here is hoplos. And hoplos, the root of hoplos means generous or wide open, wide open. If your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, the Greek here is poneros. Poneros means narrow or clouded. Or in in the King James, I love this, it's evil. When you give somebody the evil eye, you you go like that, see? It's narrow. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is the darkness? What my son does is he replaces the lens. You know, over time, the lens gets cloudy, the lens in your eye. And so every once in a while, you just need to put in a new lens. Uh, And then he, he literally says, it fills your body with light. It lets the light in. And so what I'm going to do for you this morning is give you a spiritual refractive surgery. I'm going to give you a new lens in your spiritual eye so that your whole body is full of light. Your whole body can see broader and wider because that is the sixth stage of grief. God puts a lot of paradoxes in the Bible. The paradoxes, by the way, again, Greek Para means beside, and doxa means truth. Two truths beside each other that seem to be opposite, but when put together, it makes each of them more truthful. That's a paradox. And one of the things he does in Scripture is he puts the paradox of having to, for here to also be connected with there. You can't just concentrate on here and get the whole truth. You've got to also concentrate on there. It says in... Um, Second Kings, and I, and I love this. I love this story. Um, the the uh, uh, King Aram uh, uh, um, is after uh, uh, Elijah and, and Elisha, and 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 uh, Elisha goes out to Dothan, and and so he sends forces to surround uh, Elisha and his servant. And his servant goes out early in the morning, and he sees all these enemy troops surrounding them. And of course, he's panicked. And he goes into Elisha and he describes the situation. And Elisha just comes out with a little smirk on his face. 
<laughs> and this is what it says in Second Corinthians or Second Kings six seventeen. Open his eyes, Lord, that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. In other words, Elisha and his servant were surrounded by the enemy, but the enemy was surrounded by the forces of God. You've got to look a little bit further than immediately in front of you. One of my favorite memories is when I was a kid, and... and, uh, and I'm going to tell you childhood stories, and I'll tell you why uh, at the end of this. But uh, uh, all the kids in my neighborhood had squirt guns. These are the early days of squirt guns, when, when squirt guns really didn't work very well. I mean, it's like, you might as well just throw holy water on people. It was just like, it was, it was good for about three feet, you know? But they looked so good. They, they, they just looked so good. And, and so I wanted a squirt gun, so I went to my mama and and we, we had no money. My dad had died. My mom was struggling to raise two kids by herself. And she said, Joey, honey, I wish I could buy you that. But we just haven't got that money. You know we don't. So I went to my grandparents. Grandparents are always the court of appeal. <laughs> grandparents are the court of appeal. And, and so I went to my grandparents. And, and, and I went in and I said, Pop. And I tried to get my lower lip to hang out so I could get some sympathy. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, all the other boys in our neighborhood have squirt guns. But... I haven't got one because we're too poor. <laughs> My grandfather looked at me and said, Joey, I'll make you a squirt gun. Well, that's not what you want to hear. <laughs> you don't want to, you know, it's like your grandmother says, don't worry about the problem, I'll make you a suit. You don't want it. You don't want your. So I, but back in that day, you didn't say, no, I want to, you just said, thank you. And so he goes down, comes up from the basement. Now, my, my grandfather was a large animal veterinarian horses and cows and 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 he had a syringe back in that day it was glass with a with a metal sleeve and and he had a syringe with a with a needle cut off and i and i looked at it and he said watch this he filled that thing with water that thing shot i went back to my neighborhood I could hit any kid on a dead run, 15 yards, 20 yards. I could hit any kid. Now, 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 I say that to say to you, grief has a way of kind of shutting us down and making pay, uh, us pay attention to only what's right in front of us. That's what it does. But, but our target is out there. We've got to be able to, we've got to, no matter what, how you compare yourself to anybody else, and please don't do that. That's just a, always a loser's game. You know, it doesn't matter what they have. It's what God is going to give you to reach those people out there. That's the, that's the sixth stage of grief. You look out. And so, and so, and there's also this thing about grief that just um, fixates us. It, 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 um, it arrests our vision. It arrests our emotions. It gets us focused on itself. But looking outward clarifies our purpose. Uh, our, our personally, um, we've got to see the bigger picture in things because that's how God. And, and when you go through something, the most natural question was, what was that about? Well, if you hang in there long enough, believe me, I'm an old guy. You'll find out what that was all about because there's a purpose for everything we go through because what we go through doesn't happen to us unless it comes through God first. Do you know that? Do you know that? It, it, remember Joseph when his brothers sold him into slavery? These burger-headed brothers sold him into slavery. And he went into Egypt as a slave. And out of God's providence and his own hard work and industriousness, he rose to the second most powerful person in the world. Years later, his brothers come to him begging him for food because there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a vast... Um, 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 famine in the land, and they don't recognize him. They don't recognize that this is the brother they sold into slavery. And Joseph reveals himself. Well, of course, they're scared to death because Joseph could have them killed like that. And Joseph looked at them, and this is in, in Genesis 50, 50, 20. He said, don't worry. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. 
You've been through what you've been through for the good of other people. It's not just about your comfort level. It's not just about what the circumstances. God has a plan that he's going to use your life to bless other people, to save other lives, so to speak. And I know that we get all preoccupied with the pain of what we've been through or the fear of what we've been through. When I was growing up, there was this guy in our neighborhood. And I, and I think he, you know, you know. <laughs> but he was a construction worker. And back then, you know, it, construction workers didn't, didn't work machines. They, were, they lifted block and they put cement on stuff. And, and, and you could, this guy's muscles were just rippling through his arms. And he just always wore this T-shirt. And his name was Joe Kurtzman. I'll never forget him. Lived two doors down. And one day he wasn't in a very good mood. And, uh, and, and I, I did something stupid in his backyard. I don't even remember what it was. But he came out that back door, and he looked at me and said, Joey, if you ever do that again, I'm going to spank you. Well, I knew if that boy ever got a hold of me, that man, he would break me in half. I mean, it wasn't just about my rear hurting. It was about my, my life. And I was petrified. And I went home, and of course, I didn't, you didn't tattle back then. You didn't run straight to your mom, and so I, but I was just out of sorts. And my mom came in. Mom's going to do this. She just sensed it in a moment. She said, what's wrong? I said, nothing. She said, tell me what's wrong. And I said, Mr. Kurtzman just said, if I ever do something in his yard again, he's going to spank me. And my, mo- <laughs> my mother looked at me and said, he can't spank you. I said, he can't? She said, no. Two reasons. First of all, it's against the law. And second, to spank you, he'd have to come through me. Now, my mama was, wasn't 90 pounds soaking wet. But as anybody in this place can tell you, if you have to go through somebody's mama to harm their child, my money's always on the mama. Always. And the dad. And the dad who will protect His kids. What I learned that day was when something hurtful happens to us, we are usually closed down to dwell on it. And it clouds everything else. We can't see anything else because we keep replaying those words in our mind and we keep replaying that event in our mind. But but if we will see wider, if we will see that God is going to work some good out of this, it happened, but but in order to get to us, it had to come through God, so therefore God has some purpose in it, then then the whole thing changes. And you're not afraid anymore. You're just interested to see what God's going to do with it. Now let me tell you a third point, or fourth, or whatever I'm on. I can't can't even remember. Uh, um, that's, That's the personal fixation, but there's an organizational fixation that is equally worse. Pastor Justin has been preaching about this recently. Uh, Pastor Tyler gave a great talk to a, a, a group of uh, uh, A-team leaders the other day talking about this is not, when you gather to serve people, it's not about getting with your friends. It's all about the first time people are walking in. Pastor Justin has taken it even further, and this is, this is wonderful. He's talking about how can we love people who don't walk through the door? How can, how, how can we be for them. Uh, And so organizationally, a wider view always takes us beyond our group. You know, Jesus made things super uncomfortable for religious people because he was always taking his disciples beyond the religious group. It was beyond, you know, people who believed like he did. And that was uncomfortable for them. It says this in um, in, um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 46. Through 48, it says, if you love those who love you, what reward do you get? You know, this, I love this church. I love, I love this church. And I love my friends from years and years ago. But what credit is that to me? I mean, we, we're, we like each other. You know, we believe the same stuff. And, and, and we're on mission together. Um, and that's wonderful. Don't give that up. Don't discount that. That's something many people don't have. So that in itself is a special gift. But it's not God's heart. God's heart 
hasn't been completed yet. Here's what what it says. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, this is, this is important because you remember how uh, the Bible at one point says, don't call earthly people your father. You have one father who's in heaven. That doesn't mean you don't really have biological fathers and you're not to respect them. It says respect your father and mother. Uh, but, but, but what it means is ultimately we're to, we're to see that God has a purpose, a fatherly passion for all of us. There's a role that is so important, just like Pastor John said, there's a role that is so important for you men. And even if you're not biological fathers, you will be a spiritual father to someone. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a church grandfather by this time. If, if, if Dr. Hunter seems too formal for you, you can always call me Pop, because that's what I always called my grandfather. And, and, and that role is so important because it's the role of our Heavenly Father. And when it says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, listen to what that word means. The Greek word here is teleos. We get the word telescope from it. Teleos means the end or the completion or the maturity. That is, taking in all that's supposed to be taken into, watch this, and fitted to the end. Fitted to when you get to heaven, you look back. Fitted to the end of your life, when you look back, what will you be glad of? And this is what you will be glad of, that you just didn't stick to your own group. You just didn't stick to relationships that were easy or rewarding. But you went into other kinds of relationships that were strange and risky. I mean, you, you remember how many accusations came against Jesus because he was hanging out with the wrong people, right? And, and, and so what's important here, let me, let me tell you about a book, a really important book. This is a, uh, and it was probably several years ago. It's called The Rise of Christianity. And the subtitle is How the Obscure Marginal Jesus Movement Became the Dominant Religious Force in the Western World in a Few Centuries. You know, we started out persecuted. We started out not even being able to show who we were. And within a few centuries, we became the largest and have remained the largest religion in the world. Now, how did that happen? Stark, who's a sociologist at the University of Wisconsin and, and a professor of comparative religions as well, said there's two main reasons. Number one, because we had an assurance, a very clear answer as to what happens to you after you die. Everybody is interested in that. And I'm going to come back to that at the end of the sermon. But everybody is interested not only for themselves, but for those they love. And Christianity has, Christ has the answer to that. One that you can be sure of. You can stake your life on. But here was the second reason. The second reason was... That in the early days, when there were um, epidemics, and there have been COVIDs from way back when, all of the wealthy people went to the hill country. They evacuated the cities because they didn't want to be contaminated. They didn't want to be infected. They didn't want to get sick. Everybody ran that could run except for the Christians. And the Christians stayed behind. And the Christians took care of, watch this, they cared for not just the other Christians, but for everybody. People who had been persecuting them, people who were not like them, people who had different values, people who had different religions, they cared for everybody, many at the cost of their own lives. And when the world saw that, they thought, what is worth this kind of sacrifice to love this widely. And they started to get interested in Christianity. Do you know how we can do that this, today? I mean today. There's a means we didn't have, even have last year at this point. 
And we mentioned it during, uh, to some of the services uh, during the uh, Q&A time. Uh, but let me remind you of it. And you can go to your uh, um, um, cell phone and you can, you can go to centralfloridapledge.com. All right? You don't have to do it now, but you can do it. centralfloridapledge.com. A little while ago, after October 7th, after after the attacks um, on the Jewish community, we noticed the attacks, the rise in in, um, anti-Semitism, the rise in Islamophobia, um, and and, and we decided we didn't want to have a, a community like that. We didn't want people to be able to be attacked for who they were without us standing with them in that attack. And so I helped organize, and, and Pastor Justin was in on the, on the originating committee, and he was one of the first to sign on, that says this. Number one, I will respect, I will treat everyone with respect, especially those with whom I disagree. All right? You get what the, where this is going. And number two, if any group is attacked in my community, I'm going to stand with them. Not because I agree with them, not because I endorse them, not because I'm trying to promote them, but because, not because of who they are, because who I am, who Jesus Christ is in me. Jesus Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That's who he is. And so if you go and you sign on to that, here's what I'd love you to do. It has a little section there. It just says, why are you signing on? Just put Action Church. All of the, all of the, a lot of the big community leaders are signed on. The president of Florida Hospital, the president of the Orlando Science Center, the mayors, the sheriffs, the heads of, of leading nonprofits, every, every, you know, you could, the heads of the superintendents of schools. I mean, you can sign on. You can, you can see what it is. You'll see what it is when you sign on. But here's what I'd love to see. When people look down that list of why people have signed on, I'd love to see thousands of people signed on that put Action Church so that they know Action Church cares for people no matter who they are. That's how the original church grew. That's how we'll grow. In this, in this very pagan culture, uh, that's going to that's gonna help uh, uh, us to stand out uh, and for people to be grateful that we're here. Yeah. All right. Here's the last one. And this is, again, this is an old guy's perspective. This is what I can do for you. Every, 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 lots of people can come and give you spiritual insight, and all of us need that. And I sit where you're sitting every week just so that I can take notes and I can learn more and I can get closer to Jesus. But one of the things that I can especially provide for you is what is your perspective when you get to the end of your life? Uh, I've, got, I've got some years left, I think, you know, God willing. But, but I'm, I'm going towards 80 here. And I, and I can look back and I, see, I can see what mattered and what didn't matter. What lasted and what didn't last. And here's, I, I said this to, in response to one question uh, in one of the services last week. Um, uh, I said, you know, when you... All of us have a whole list of stuff to do and to accomplish. You know, we all have these, you know, things that we'd either like to be or get accomplished or things we have to do just to keep our nose above water. And so we're all filled with these to-do lists. When you get to be my age, those to-do lists are still there, but they're not all that important. What's important is not what you accomplished or what you failed at. Success and failure are both imposters. And when I say that, I mean neither of them stay around for long. And neither of them is really worth trying to go back and camp out on. It doesn't matter. They don't matter. What really matters is who did you do good with and who did you do good for? It's not what, it's who. That's, what, that's what, what our God says. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship. And so therefore, let me tell you, 
when I was a young pastor, I, uh, um, and we were just, gee, we were just starting. We, our salary was $14,000 a year. You try and live on $14,000 even back then. You can say, well, that's a lot of money back then. No one, no one. But somebody gave us a, a, a trip to this church growth conference, and we just thought, well, man, we just, that, that'd be great. And so we went out to Robert Schuler's Institute of Church Growth. And, 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 and we stayed out there, and, and, and it was a good conference. Uh, we, we learned a lot. We're, we were always learning a lot. But we're back, we're back, and now we're coming home. We're at LAX, and, and, um, and we're standing in line, going to the ticket uh, place. And, I'm, of course, I'm not paying attention. Guys don't pay attention. It's just like... Okay, I, I mean, I'm not on my phone. I'm just saying, okay, here's, okay, let's move along. Okay. Becky is listening to what's happening. The line's not moving because there's a woman at the counter arguing with the ticket. And she's saying, the ad said $79. And this, this is $79. And, and, and the ticket master was trying, or ticket counter guy was saying, trying to say, no, it meant $79 per way with a round trip ticket. You could get it for that price. You know, you can't get it for $79 if you're just going one. She said, I don't need to go one way. I don't need to go round trip. My dad is dying, and I don't even know if I'm going to be able to get there on time. I've got to get on this plane. I don't have any more money. I didn't see any of this going on. All I saw was Becky, who is the most polite person in the world. She turned to me, and she said, how much money we got? Now, back in this day, I, you know, you talk about pe- the generation that came before cell phones. I'm the generation that came before credit cards. We didn't have credit cards back then. I mean, not most people. They were in existence, but regular people didn't have them. I, I didn't, we didn't have a prayer. All we had was the money in my pocket until next payday. That's all we had to get home. That's all. She looked at, how much money we got? I said, I don't know, 70, 80 bucks. She said, give it to me. <laughs> Becky never said... Well, I said, okay. I, I, didn't, I didn't even know what was going on. You know, she just kind of took control. This woman who will not get up in a ball game to go to the bathroom because she's afraid of being a distraction, <laughs> did she, like a fullback, plowed through that line. I mean, under the stands, I mean, edging people out of the way slapped that money down on that counter, looked at that ticket master and said, give her the ticket. Well, the guy looked at kind of gave her the ticket. The woman turned to him and said, oh, tell me your address. You know, I'll pay you back. Becky said, you don't have time. Run! <laughs> and we saw this woman run down that. T- I don't know whether she ever made the plane or not. But I saw my wife for who she was. And I saw that woman, and I'll never forget her as long as I I live. This is 50 years ago. I still see her. What is important is not what you do, but who you do it with and who you do it for. That's what you remember. And so when we come to salvation, now we're coming to salvation, I want to tell you something. When you raise your hand to follow Jesus, it's not just for you. I mean, it's the most important decision you'll ever make in your whole life. But it's not just for you. I bet in 55 years of ministry, I've had way more than a thousand funerals. And I've I've listened to all kinds of just really messy theology. You know, people making up where their loved one is, you know? I bet he's up there drinking beers with his buddies. (laughs) Oh, gosh. (laughs) People just make stuff up. But you know, they're just kind of whistling past the graveyard. They're just kind of hoping that's true. Let me tell you what's important. What's important is that when you get saved, Those who love you will have that assurance. 
They won't have a doubt. It won't be some made up theology. It'll be a historic fact because there was one person that came back from the grave and was witnessed by 500 people. It's a historic fact. And we're going to hang our head on that. A couple of weeks ago, I was at Oviedo and uh, this young man, Will, I love this guy. He's, uh, he's been in several of the classes that I've taught, and he's always, he always has good questions. But in a couple of years, he was, he was just kind of concerned for his father. And a couple of weeks ago, when I was in Oviedo, Will came up to me. And he said, my father got saved. I wish you could have seen the expression on his face. Do your people who love you have that kind of assurance? If something happens to you, could they know for sure where you're going? Because raising your hand is as important for them as it is for you. If you love them and if they love you. And so let's do what we do. I'm going to say every head bowed and every eye closed, but today I want to break precedent. They'll come after me for this. I want to give you permission to peek. I want to give you permission to peek. And I want everyone in here, everyone at Oviedo, everyone at Sanford, everyone online, and you can tell people you raised your hand afterwards. If you want Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, as a public declaration, so that the people who love you can have the assurance as a part of your love for them, I want you to raise your hand with me right now, and I will pray the prayer of assurance. Would you raise your hand if you want Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior? Raise your hand right now. Raise it high. Raise it high. Raise it high. Several in the middle. Several. Okay. All right. All right. Now bow your, bow your head and close your eyes. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross to pay for our sins. Thank you for giving us the assurance that when we die, we will live with you and the saints forever. We will have a new, complete, and wonderful life and know why all this stuff happened. Then we will know fully, even as we've been fully known. But we want to make this declaration not just for us, but for those who love us, for their assurance, because that's the part of the way we love them. We know you love them as well. So, Lord, we thank you for your gift of salvation. And we ask you to Jesus to come into our hearts and make us a whole lot more like you, loving like you loved. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's give it up. Let's thank, thank God for the people that raised their hands.